um, actually a very special day in the life of the church. It's the Sunday that always comes, uh, the Sunday after Epiphany, early on in the year in January, and it's called Baptism of the Lord Sunday. In just a moment, I'm going to read the scripture passage from the third chapter of the Gospel of Luke, and that is the account in Luke's Gospel of the baptism of Jesus. There's a reason why Baptism of the Lord Sunday always takes place during this time of the year in early January, and the reason has to do with where we are going from here. So Advent leading up to Christmas looks at that time leading up to and including the birth of Jesus. And then the holy day of the Epiphany is the visit of the wise men. That is the Sunday that closes out Christmas. That's when we remember the church being open to people of all ages and nations and races, when the Gentiles, in a sense, through the wise men, were, were brought in, or at least a sign was given that that was going to be the place, well, or that was going to take place. Well, after that, you know, we don't know a lot about the childhood of Jesus. There's one little story in the Gospel of Luke from when Jesus was 12, but otherwise it skips forward to his adulthood and to the beginning of his public ministry. There's a funny thing about the Gospels in every one of them, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you cannot get into the public ministry of Jesus without going through his baptism. It was his baptism that signaled the beginning of that, his entrance onto the stage of the Galilee, and then later on down through Samaria and into Jerusalem where his public ministry would take place. The beginning of the Gospels covers the baptism of Jesus, and at the end of his life, after his resurrection and before his ascension into heaven, lo and behold, we see baptism show up again. And it shows up again because Jesus calls together his followers, and he prepares them for the mission that he has got them to pursue out in the world, and that is a mission of calling people to hear the gospel and to respond to it, to become believers. And he says that he wants us to go into the world and to make disciples of him. And there's a way that we're called to make disciples, and that is, you guessed it, through baptism. By baptizing them, Jesus says, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And so now we are through the birth and the childhood of Jesus, and we're, we're about to move into a season of looking at his public ministry. And so in order for us to do that between now and Easter, we need to go through his baptism. So you see the altar set up to recognize that fact behind me today. But you also see at the place where we usually take communion, the four stations that we usually take communion, you see that there are four pedestals that are set up this morning. On each of those pedestals, there is a bowl of water. After the message today, I'm going to ask Ernest to come back to the organ, and he's going to play a little bit for us, and I'm going to invite all of you to come forward down to one of these stations and to just touch that water. You're welcome to make the sign of the cross upon your chest or upon your forehead, or perhaps you just want to, to touch your heart. But to do that, to touch that water, is a way to remember the waters of your baptism and to be thankful. And so I'm going to invite you to do that. We're going to talk a little bit about what baptism means during the message this morning. And then I'll invite you to come forward and to recall your own baptism, to call that to mind and to be thankful for what it means. You'll be invited to stay here in prayer, of course, as the Spirit leads you this morning. So let's begin with the scripture passage that comes from the third chapter of the Gospel of Luke. It is a split reading this morning. I'm going to begin with verse 15, read down to 17, and then skip down to verses 21 and 22. If you'd like to follow along, this is the story of the baptism of our Lord. Hear God's word. The people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Christ. John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but one more powerful than I will come, the thongs of whose sandals I am unworthy to untie. 
He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And now verse 21. When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. This is God's Word. Amen. You pray with me. May the words of my mouth, Father, and the, the thoughts and the meditations within each one of us be found pleasing in your sight. For you are indeed our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So let me begin this morning with a promo for uh, a new television show that I'd like to pitch to you. You be the studio executives, okay? You get to decide if this show will fly. Here goes. It was 82 years old. The structure was sound, but there were major flaws. Plaster deterioration, holes in the stained glass windows, water damage, a basement full of asbestos, and a musty smell like your grandma's attic in the dead of summer. They loved their old chapel, but something had to be done. And the only thing that would fix it? Extreme makeover. <laughs> Church edition. You think that would work, huh? It's pretty good, right? I mean, think about it. We could be the pilot episode. And after that, we could go around. We could get Ty Pennington back. He could be, he could be the host. We could go all over America restoring churches to their original beauty on primetime, no less. Well, I got to admit, I have had chapel on the brain for the past 16 months. And it's just so wonderful that this project is nearly complete. I say nearly, we're not quite complete. There is one more very important step. Just this past week, we had the contractor here making measurements and preparing to do the work on the outside on Johnson Avenue to reconfigure the porch so that we're going to be able to have an ADA-compliant wheelchair ramp to allow folks with mobility issues to have easy access in and out of the chapel. We do want to make sure that we make space for everyone at the table. And so that step is an important one that we have yet to accomplish. But other than that, the project is complete. We've been in there for two Sundays. The Lord Jesus has been praised. It has been fantastic. And what I'm left with here, now that we're mostly on the back side of it, is I'm left with the thought of what does this mean? I mean, this, this thing that we've done, that has taken up time and energy and certainly has, has cost us of our talents and our treasure. How do we understand this project? And I've thought about a couple of different ways. One of them is the simple stewardship of the thing. And that's to kind of think about things in the present, in this day and age. I mean, here we are. We're the church right now. We have been given an inheritance. We have had this thing that has been placed in our hands. It's all around us. It's, it's down the halls. It's every room in this church. And yes, it's this chapel that we have that is, is just to our east here. And we have a responsibility to care for those things. And so part of what we've done is we've just, we've done the stewardship of taking care of that which has been entrusted into our care for this day. That's one way. Another way is to think not about the not about the present, but rather about the future. And that's the kind of, what's it gonna, what's it gonna be for us? I mean, we're gonna enjoy the heck out of that thing. We've already started doing it. And so one way to think about it is what we ourselves gain as a congregation in the future when we think about what it is going to, to represent for us. 
We looked at it. We saw what good it could do for our worshiping life in the future, and, and so we did it. So that's, that's the kind of future-oriented tense as a way to think about it. But I actually think that there is that there's a third way to think about that restoration project, and that is thinking not about the present and not about the future, but rather about the past. Do you know what that image is right there? It's the, yeah, that's right, it's the cornerstone. That's the, the original chapel cornerstone. It's in, a, it's in a closet, the boiler room, just in this hallway over here. And one of these days, I'm going to bring it in and show it to you, but it weighs about 187 pounds. And so I got to figure out something I can set it on that it's not going to crush first. But that is the cornerstone that was laid in the chapel 83 years ago this year. Now think about that time period. It's right in the middle of the Great Depression. It's a time when folks didn't have much. I'm sure there were plenty of congregations in Arkansas that thought about building a church and then looked at the money they had coming in and said, "Mm, not this decade. But our congregation did build. They stepped out on faith and they built a stone church because they wanted that church to be a beacon to the town of Springdale and throughout this part of the world, a a community where believers could come to know the Lord Jesus Christ and where God could be praised. And so they stepped out on faith and they built it. You can step forward a little bit further in time and look at a picture like this one. Uh, Mary McKinney sent me this picture. This is a photograph of the 1964 Vacation Bible School class. And that's them right out in front of the chapel, would have called it just the church then or the sanctuary. They're on the steps there looking down at Johnson Avenue. Mary's actually in that picture. Can you find her? Look real closely. Look at the second row down from the top over on the, oh, there she is right there. There's Mary smiling and and looking out at the camera. And if you think about this, if, if you think about back to that generation that stepped out on faith and built this church, or if you think about uh, the generations that came after, including the 1964 Vacation Bible School class, you think back over the past 80 plus years of this congregation's life and what you're thinking about there is you're thinking about a covenant, aren't you? You're thinking about the covenant that God has established with our church family that has lasted down through the decades and down through the generations. Do you know what a covenant is? A covenant in the Bible is when God brings two parties together that are not blood kin and he makes them family. That's why we talk about marriage as a covenant because in marriage, two people who are not related to each other, they come together and by the blessing of God Almighty, they become a family. A covenant is also what a church is. A covenant is what we are made as members of the same family and it's what we are made through our, through our baptism. We're made part of the same family. And when you think about that, then what that means is we, we have a great responsibility, don't we? We have a responsibility first to God because after all, it's not our church in the end. It's God's church. But we are part of God's family in this church. And so our first responsibility is to God. And I would suggest, brothers and sisters, that our second responsibility is to the spiritual mothers and the spiritual fathers who came before us, who passed this wonderful treasure down into our hands. And so what we're doing when we're doing the work of restoration, what we're doing when we're doing the work of renovation is we are maintaining the covenant. We are looking back to the past, to what God has created amongst our church family, and we are safeguarding it and stewarding it to pass it on. It's not just about the present. It's not just about the future. It's about our past. That's where we look to find our identity, and it is that identity that can truly carry us into our future together as a family. As I said earlier today, as 
baptism of the Lord Sunday. And it is the Sunday when we think about what it means for us to keep covenant in much the same way that we, that we keep covenant, that we maintain covenant when we engage in a project like the one that we have the past few months. I love thinking about baptism and talking about it because it's one of those things that we know is important, but oftentimes I just don't think we don't know why. We only ever do it once. We take Holy Communion every month or perhaps even even every week, but we're only ever baptized once. And for many of us, as Pastor Todd was talking about to the children, we don't remember it personally. So why is it important? What is baptism after all? What does it mean when we bring forward a child or even an adult and we, we pour water over that person's head and we lay hands on them and say, I baptize, I baptize you. Well, we know it's important because we find it in the Bible. I mean, that's easy enough. Jesus doesn't go into his public ministry without being baptized. And as we say, he tells us to go out and baptize others. But to know it's important and to know why it's important, well, those are two different things. About 500 years ago in the life of the church, there was language that was coined around the sacraments to talk about why they are important. When we say the sacraments, we're talking about Holy Communion or the Lord's Supper and baptism. And that teaching that was developed about 500 years ago uses a formula, and the formula goes like this, that the sacraments, that the Lord's Supper and baptism, that these are outward and visible signs of an inward and spiritual grace. Now, if you get that, then you can start to get an idea about why they are so important. What are the outward and visible signs? <clears throat> well, when it comes to the Lord's Supper, the outward and visible signs are the bread and the cup. You see them up here right now. They're the bread and wine of communion. They are the things, they are the things that God has given us in the scriptures that we're supposed to utilize in order to celebrate Holy Communion here in the church. When it comes to baptism, the things are the water and the words, the pouring of the water on the person being baptized and the speaking the words of God. I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. But as outward and visible signs, they are but signifiers of something that goes underneath them, of a spiritual power that is none other than the power of the Holy Spirit. And God in his wisdom for whatever reason has chosen these outward and visible signs to be the means through which he works his grace in our lives. Think for a moment about the last time that you stood on the banks of a river. Let's say a river after a, a good, hard, and steady rain where the water has come up and, 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 and the current is flowing swiftly in front of you. You stand on the banks of that river, when, when you really take it in, you can think about the power that's represented, the sheer kinetic energy that's represented there in front of you. As you stand looking at the water rushing by you, there are thousands and thousands of gallons every minute. This is a natural thing that has the ability to, to carry boulders to the sea, to uproot trees and carry them down. There's some good power in a river. It can create energy can use the water to drink. There's food swimming around in it after all. But there's, there's also destructive power as well. I mean, rivers have the ability to create erosion, mudslides, to carry homes away downstream to take, to take people's lives. The one thing we don't think about when, when we look at a river in that way is we don't usually think about what's underneath it. What is underneath it? You know, it's a ditch. It's a U-shaped trough in the ground. I mean, pick up the river in your mind. Pick up the river, take it over, and set it down. And what do you have left? What you have left is a channel. And the channel by itself can't do anything. I mean, it's just this, it's just this thing in the ground. It's just a ditch. It can't, it can't do anything at all. Except, except without that trough in the ground... The river couldn't exist at all. 
The channel has no power on its own, but without the channel, there would be no form and no direction for the river to take. This is like baptism for us, or like the Lord's Supper. God has chosen a channel, not a channel for water, but rather a channel for his grace. And the channels that he has chosen for his grace are the bread and wine of the Eucharist and, and the water and the words of baptism. They are the outward and visible signs of the inward and the spiritual grace. And that grace is none other than the power of the Holy Spirit. If we will be open to those channels, if we will come forward when we receive, if you will be open when you come forward to, to touch those waters and to remember your baptism this morning, then the channel that will be opened up to you is indeed a channel of power. It is a channel of grace. It is a channel of the Holy Spirit. We see that in the event of Jesus' baptism itself. The baptism could not have happened without the water and the words. It was the water of the river Jordan, and it was the words that John the Baptist spoke over Jesus. But we also recognize, and we see in that scripture passage, that the Holy Spirit was linked to the water of Jesus' baptism as if they were yoked together. John tells us this on the front end when he says, You think I have power? There is one who is coming the thongs of whose sandals I shouldn't even be untying. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. There it is, the Holy Spirit and with fire, John says. And then, of course, in the act of his baptism itself, it says that the heavens were opened up and the Spirit descended upon him bodily as if like a dove upon his head. The voice of God was heard saying, this is my son whom I love. You know, uh, this past summer, uh, Emily and the kids and I went down to Central Texas to a family reunion. It was hot. And um, we were all there, my mom and dad, my brothers, my sister, and all the, all the grandkids. And my brother Barkley, who lives down in that part of Texas, uh, brought a lot of photographs with him. And he gave one to me, and I had never seen it before. And th this was the photograph right here. And it was absolutely remarkable to me. Now, that photo was taken in 1897. That is a 122-year-old photograph. And it's of a family sitting on their front porch in a dusty little central Texas town called Flatonia. And you know why that, do you know, do you know why that uh, photograph is remarkable to me? That's my family. The man in the middle of that photo is my great-great-grandfather, Richard Owen Ferris. He was the sheriff of Fayette County. And the woman to the right is his wife. Do you see the family resemblance, by the way? Imagine me with a Wyatt Earp mustache, maybe. Uh, the woman to the right is his wife, Eliza. She's my great-great-grandmother. And the girl on the far left-hand side of the frame is Tummy. That was her nickname. Her name was Ira called her Tummy, and that is my great-grandmother. Um, and I never met him, of course. <laughs> I never met him. Uh, Tummy uh, died in the 1920s, very early, uh, in her, or relatively early in her life, died a tragic, tragic death. And as I was sitting there holding this photograph, I just, I just was awestruck by it. I thought, you know, I never met these people. I mean, the one Tummy, she died 50 years uh, before I was born. And yet, yet we're in the same family. <laughs> um, we share a covenant together, in a way. And I thought, you know, th this family, that's my, that's my family, if, if they hadn't done what they did and passed on that legacy to me, if they hadn't given their lives in the way that they did, then I would never have had life myself. And I thought about that, and I thought, you know, that's the responsibility that we have. Um, we receive something from those who came before us, from our mothers and our fathers, who are even now in the great 
cloud of witnesses above. And they pass that into our hands. And they're members of our family, whether we ever met them or not. And we have a responsibility to those who come later as they had a responsibility to us. We've been made part of the same family by our baptism. And by our baptism, we can know God as our father, the church as our mother, and one another as brothers and sisters. And there are outward and visible signs all around us. Some of them are in cornerstones, and some of them are in photographs of 50-year-old vacation Bible school classes. And some of them are right over there. And if we will receive those outward and visible signs as God means us to have them, then they can be the channels of great spiritual power. We can know through baptism and through the fellowship of God's family that we have a place to belong and that the love of Christ is ours. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. I'm gonna invite us to prayer in just a moment. Let me go ahead and invite Ernest to come on down. After we pray together, I'm just gonna invite you as you feel led. It doesn't, it could be like communion. We can get up in rows if you want to, or perhaps you just wanna come down as the Spirit leads you, to come down and to remember that to the waters of your baptism, that God has called you to belong. He's called you to be a part of his family. So we're gonna come down and spend a few minutes this morning just remembering that and rejoicing and giving God our thanks. Will you pray with me? Holy God, we, we give you thanks that through the waters of baptism, you have called us to be a part of your family. The scripture tells us that once we were no people, but now we are your people. We give you thanks for that. We give you thanks for those who came before, and we give you thanks for those who will surely come after. While we are here, gathered together, as a part of this body. We pray that you would help us to bear witness to the love that you have given us in Jesus our Lord and to share that love with the world. We ask these things in his name. Amen. And so now, will you come?